my apologies if the slides are representing a word document <laughs> no 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 i think they they look great and especially i think the model rfp it's important to cover the content so that yeah, because uh, what, what do the information is so much no so yeah, um, yeah. Uh, unfortunately i don't know how to make arrows fly so <laughs> okay <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll just wait for a few more minutes and then we will get started at 3 p.m. Thanks, okay. thanks, Neeti. Thanks, thanks. Kuzar, sir. Good afternoon, DG, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Ah, hey, good afternoon, Gulzar. How are you? I'm good, sir. Very nice to see you. So let me also remove my mask. Thank you for taking time to join this uh, very important webinar, Gulzar. Really appreciate it. Thanks for inviting, sir. Thank you.
I see Dr. Basavaraju also joined in. Uh, Dr. Basavaraju ji, do you want to test your mic, please? Uh, good afternoon, Paresh ji. This is Dr. Basavaraju. Good afternoon. Thank you, sir. Uh, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Shekhar uh, Bono, uh, Director General, Development Monitoring and Evaluation Office, uh, Niti Aayog. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the central, state, and district officials who have joined this uh, webinar, and also other colleagues all across India who have joined. Uh, today, uh, this webinar is about uh, procurement of uh, technical consultancies, uh, scaling capacity within the state governments. This is the uh, seventh session in the series of webinars which are being conducted by DMO with the objective of uh, strengthening monitoring and evaluation ecosystem in the uh, country. The focus of today's webinar is to understand key challenges in procurement at the state level, enable sharing of experiences and good practices in the field of procurement and identify measures needed for scaling up of procurement capacities within the state governments. <clears throat> uh, for uh, to strengthen monitoring and evaluation ecosystem across the uh, country, um, definitely uh, there's a immense need for uh, strengthening uh, various institutions. And as a part of that uh, institution strengthening, uh, there is uh, immense need for building capabilities relating to uh, procurement and outsourcing. Once an institution can uh, master this art of uh, doing good procurement and getting good quality work done by the uh, outsourced agencies, the capability of that organization to pivot and uh, do large amount of work uh, increases. So in that context, procurement uh, uh, and capabilities become extremely uh, critical. Uh, Development Monitoring Evaluation Office in the uh, last couple of years has managed to do uh, 125 centrally sponsored scheme evaluation over a period of one year and has been working on output outcome monitoring framework, uh, data governance, and many other uh, elements, aspects, which are quite challenging in scope. And we have managed to do them uh, largely because of uh, two or three reasons. One is definitely uh, procurement, outsourcing, and getting things done. 
the second important element is uh, having strong partnerships with uh, knowledge or knowledge institutions and if we can have uh, a partnership with knowledge institutions uh, through uh, established procurement process uh, i think the ability of an institution government institutions to leverage the immense knowledge that exists among the uh, various knowledge institutions for public policy program purposes uh, becomes uh, uh, very very uh, helpful but unfortunately uh, procurement is not uh, given as much importance as it should be given in a large number of government entities and it is generally relegated to um, part of uh, accounting department uh, where else procurement of technical consistencies uh, require a degree of uh, capabilities in terms of uh, defining uh, the terms of reference and also qualifications and so forth but it's also not as complex as people make out uh, by standardizing uh, and also uh, by uh, exploring the uh, options available under general financial rules including uh, limited uh, using more extensively limited tender i think the ability of uh, organizations to use uh, high quality procurement uh, to outsource and get uh, technical uh, work done uh, would expand uh in the end i, I also would urge uh, that it's uh, in addition to procurement uh, we should invest a lot more in building strong partnerships and uh, work with uh, regional universities uh, think tanks um and in doing so we create a, a very uh, vibrant ecosystem of uh, monitoring and evaluation and other tasks that uh, government does for public policy now i would it's a great honor uh, to introduce uh, today's keynote speaker i'm very glad that uh, shri natrajan who is the keynote speaker for today uh, has uh, on time from his busy schedule to be with us uh, mr gulzar natrajan uh, has a btech from iit chennai and later completed his masters in public administration from harvard uh, kennedy school He is an IAS from 1999 batch and is currently Secretary Finance Government of Andhra Pradesh. Welcome, uh, Guja. It's my pleasure also uh, to introduce uh, other panelists uh, of today's session. Our first panelist is Dr. Baswaraju, uh, who is the uh, Executive Director at Grassroots Research and Advocacy Movement, that is GRAM, based in Bangalore. Dr. Basuraju is a public policy and development professional, having diversified expertise in designing and conducting large-scale multidisciplinary research and evaluation studies, developing policy, vision, and strategy documents. Gram has been closely uh, supporting Karnataka Evaluation Authority, and uh, their experiences are quite uh, valuable for all of us. Our next panelist is uh, Nikki Arora. Uh, who is working at the intersection of law and public policy. Uh, Ms. Nidhi specializes in matters of infrastructure reforms. Uh, she completed her post-graduation in international economics law and policy from Stanford University, uh, California, with focus on rule of law and development. She joined Niti Aayog in 2018 and has contributed extensively to uh, enhancing private investments in public infrastructure through public-private partnerships. Last but not least, uh, I take great pleasure in introducing Paresh Dokar. Paresh is a monitoring and evaluation specialist at uh, DMO. Uh, prior to DMO, he was working as manager with Accenture uh, Management Consulting. He has over 11 years of uh, business consulting experiences across industries. He will take us through DMO's experiences in procurement of uh, technical consultancy. We look forward uh, to an engaging discussion with you all. Uh, thank you very much. And with this, I now invite uh, Sri Gulzar Natrajan to give his keynote address. Gulzar. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first, thank you, uh, sir, DMEO, for uh, inviting me to, uh, for this discussion on a very important subject, uh, 
And I must also compliment uh, the DMEO for organizing these webinars. I personally checked up with a couple of my colleagues and they find this extremely useful. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, this is a great work, sir. You should keep doing more of this. Sir. So I'll uh, use this opportunity to basically outline what we think are challenges that we face in the state. And in some ways while doing so, uh, as you will see, I'm, I would end up almost listing out what are the issues involved. Now, given this is such a new area of uh, engagement, uh, monitoring and technical consulting services providers for monitoring and evaluation, uh, it's quite natural that many of the uh, activities or the issues, many of the processes uh, are virgin and like to that extent throws up its set of uh, challenges for state governments uh, and and i have i i'll have just five slides uh, hopefully i can compress it and keep it to less than 10 minutes and look forward to the discussion the other presentations and the discussion that follows because i hope to use this more as an opportunity to sort of uh, present the challenges that we are facing and uh, more as learning experience uh, from the presentation and discussion so uh, the, the, the first issue, the first slide is just a sort of an index or listing of contents uh, in the five, five slides. Now, the first point is like, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? That like uh, monitoring and evaluation, which is supposed to be an assessment of a, health, a, 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 a performance test of programs is, is not exactly a priority uh, in our uh, development spectrum. It is not a, a, exactly a priority among stakeholders, important stakeholders, departments, or uh, the political representatives. It's, it's, it's in the mainstream. It's, it's one would, one could turn around and say that it is a good to have, uh, but hardly a mainstream imperative or priority of uh, departments. Now, can I go to the next slide, please? So let me start with uh, this issue of defining what constitutes uh, the pro the issue to be evaluated, the problem to be evaluated. Now this is not a it's a it's a non-trivial challenge. You know, most often, uh, whenever we occasionally do the evaluations, we don't define the uh, challenges or define the problem statement clearly. So that that in turn feeds into the design and uh, uh, outputs which get generated from those uh, evaluations. So, I mean, I just listed out what are from purely from a state government's perspective and especially from uh, secretary expenditure and finance department. What would I look to have look? I would like to have in terms of uh, uh, what would be outputs from uh, such an evaluation exercise. Now, some of these are specific programs which we have. Uh, one, the Nadu Nidu is a physical infrastructure program. We spend huge amounts on this. What is it really? And there is a presumption that you know you put all these things in place and outcomes will naturally follow. Uh, and this, these are all a bunch of inputs, either physical inputs or cash transfers or uh, other uh, in-kind. Uh, things. If you do this, outputs will follow. Uh, but we all know uh, that's uh, not the way that theory of change rarely works out uh, as uh, as as we we plan. So this is just a listing of uh, questions of relevance. I, it would be interesting. I when I came here, I I tried to get our guys to sort of list out four or five of our pl flagship programs and figure out what exactly do we want as headline. Uh, both on the formative and the summative side, what would we want in terms of evaluations uh, on these things? And we we really struggled with it. Uh, so this the next slide, please. Yeah. So the next thing is uh, two things about methodology and service providers. Now methodology, uh, as I said, like we. Uh, Evaluations are not quite the mainstream. They're not a, 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 an important priority of departments. And whenever very few times we do 
evaluations, we quickly hire uh, KPMG or one of those consulting organizations to do a quick uh, uh, study, which which largely is qualitative, observational, anecdotal uh, uh, study. So I, I, at some level, it would be it's 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 been challenging, or it is challenging within the state governments to uh, to outline the spectrum of possibilities or methodology options which are available and then make the right choice for the uh, specific uh, uh, context or pro, pro or evaluation that we are uh, looking for so there is this full spectrum of uh, uh, choices available from plain administrative data analysis to field experiments to surveys and so on and then service providers, as I told earlier, like the, 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 the default option is to hire the management consultants and do a quick uh, evaluation, which, which most often almost uh, always is confined to uh, qualitative assessments. Now, again, here too, we have the challenge of how do we go about doing this? Like, do we hire consulting organizations? Do we engage with research institutions? There are a large number of nonprofits who specialize in specific uh, areas, functional domains, do we hire them? Who are they, for example, in agriculture or in education? That's These are challenges which we grapple while beginning to engage with the problem. Next slide, please. This gets us to the, the set of problems which we encounter while doing the procurement process itself. Now, as I had said earlier, this is not a priority for uh, departments. Uh, the, the priority is at best to have a nice uh, consulting glossy study done by a consulting organization, which sort of in some ways is a uh, sort of an endorsement of what uh, you want the world to see or know about uh, the program than a genuine rigorous impact assessment of uh, the program. Now, uh, and, and this goes back, goes the, the one of the important uh, contributors is of course the lack of acutely uh, uh, deficient capacity among procurement officials uh, and the things about standardized procurement guidelines and documents this, these are well known like again being new areas we struggle with uh, standardized procurement guidelines for example for uh, doing an evaluation of uh, learning outcomes just 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 a, a simple thing from hiring a uh, agency to do a sample survey of learning outcomes on a longitudinal basis every year for the next three years like for example if you want to do where's a document what, what are what are the uh, guidelines for that so then then of course where documents are available we struggle with challenges in customizing those documents uh, the bid documents and the contract agreements now uh, specification of uh, terms of reference now this is important because many of these areas are uh, really new in the sense it's not possible for us ex ante to have absolute clarity about what is it that we want to evaluate as we go along we realize that like for example with education we we need to uh, sort of shift a little bit and say evaluate how teacher trainings are going on because that's approximate uh, process indicator perhaps to the uh, final outcome that we are measuring now this calls for flexibility in the documents in such a manner that we sort of are able to uh, uh, sort of on the uh, it, while at the at the process we are able to uh, tweak uh, the 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 terms of reference uh, then there is this thing about minimum technical and financial criteria, which uh, limit entry barriers to uh, now. Now, this technical and financial criteria are important because the criterion and the standard bid documents were available for uh, general consulting service providers or technical consultancy providers are uh, in some ways have very high financial, technical, experiential uh, requirements, which limit uh, uh, the uh, the uh, non-profits and other others who have deep functional expertise in those areas next please uh, 
then there is this uh, contract duration. Now we all want this uh, evaluations yesterday. So basically, this is uh, like a constraint. So we can't. We don't have the uh, the 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 flexibility or the, most often when the need for evaluation comes, it's it's like we need to have it in two months or three months. Uh, so there is a genuine challenge of reconciling rigor with practical exigencies, which then goes back to how do we, what instruments or what methodologies do we use to uh, do it in a manner which is, uh, which, which, which uh, does a good compromise between rigor and uh, what is required. Then the bit reference date, these are there are wide variations in the rates of different categories of these service providers at, at top level consulting organization rates. Its quotes will be like four or five times that with of a of a nonprofit or a research institution. Uh, then of course, and and which in turn feeds into this excessively low and high bids, which set creates a set of problems. Last one, please. Yeah, and then so th those were problems we have on the contract on on the procurement process side. Now on the contract management side, again. Uh, Going back to this challenge of capacity and lack of culture and capabilities within the organized institutional capabilities, uh, th th this creates its set of problems, which, uh, which I guess is part of any sort of ongoing engagement which we conduct within government. So to that extent, it's it's perhaps generic, not exclusively uh, uh, related to. The, the the specific issue of uh, procurement of consulting service providers. And the last thing I wanted to just put it out there is that supply side quality. Now, I, this is something which we uh, underestimate or perhaps not discussed uh, uh, seriously because there is an acute scarcity of or acute deficiency of good organizational organizations and individuals within organizations who can engage deeply on these problems and uh, de and and be able to deliver high quality evaluations which respond to the felt needs of uh, uh, the government stakeholders so in in very uh, sort of brief these are the challenges uh, that we face at the state level while engaging with the problem of uh, procuring technical consultancy service providers for uh, M&A. Uh, as I said earlier, these are in some ways a list of all the processes or activities which are involved with this, but I, I think each one of them have a, uh, an important, are, are an important source of, uh, or at least a non-trivial source of uh, challenge for the state governments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gulzar, for uh, highlighting uh, the highlighting the uh, importance given to monitoring and evaluation at states, the need for uh, prioritizing uh, monitoring and evaluation as such, but also the challenges in terms of uh, uh, raising uh, uh, understanding uh, the link, the programs and the outcomes that we would like to achieve. Uh, and so defining what are the outcomes and uh, what are the key metrics that uh, we would use to measure those outcomes. And then uh, this whole uh, ecosystem around uh, uh, doing high quality evaluation. Uh, so I, I, I think all these issues uh, we have been grappling also at the national level at the Development Monitoring Evaluation Office and over three years, we have built some uh, understanding and knowledge which we thought it was critical uh, to share with uh, our state colleagues. So with this, I now request uh, uh, Paresh to present DMO's experiences in procurement of uh, technical consultancies. Paresh. Thank you so much, sir. And thanks, Gulsar, sir, for setting the context. And as DG, sir, pointed out, the uh, challenges that you spoke about at the state level uh, are very much similar that we encountered three years back when we started this journey. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing uh, most of the central ministers' departments are also going through the same uh, learning process. And uh, hopefully our session today uh, would add some value 
uh, and also enable some exchange of some experiences and uh, good practices. Um, before I get started, just a gentle reminder to all our attendees. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, type in uh, your queries in the chat box. Also, feel free to raise your hand, uh, probably towards the Q&A session. Uh, the host will unmute you and uh, allow you to post your query. Uh, so with that, we get started with talking about DMU's uh, journey, uh, the last three year journey in creating this capacity in procurement of technical consultancy. Uh, so over the next uh, 15 minutes, probably what I would want to quickly cover is talk about the aims and principles that government of India has set it up for itself uh, in terms of public procurement. Uh, thereafter, we'll talk about some model documents that are readily available today, uh, ready templates, uh, ready model requests for proposals. Uh, there are general financial rules and mod, uh, manual for uh, GFR. So we'll talk about those model documents which are readily available, which can be of great use uh, if you're starting this journey uh, now. Uh, we will talk about a typical procurement process. How does an open tender works versus a limited tender versus a nomination based uh, procurement? And towards the end, uh, I will briefly cover what are some recent initiatives that DMU has undertaken so as to expedite the whole procurement process. So we have brought in a lot of initiatives around standardizing uh, documents and Nidhi is on the call. She has been of great help to us um, in, in actually uh, building the capacity uh, within DMU. Uh, so with that, let me start with the first section. Next slide, please. Uh, so the aims and principles of public procurement, uh, uh, we as uh, procurement professionals, uh, we have only one objective to, you know, find that right balance between cost and requirements. Uh, the, the manual uh, for procurement lays that, you know, you, uh, the professionals need to ensure that you find the right quality of at the right quantity at the right price. And obviously, uh, at the time that you at what we want, you can't delay a lot. Uh, at the place uh, that we have chosen and uh, to the right sources. Uh, so you can't favor uh, one set of organizations over the other. So these are the challenges. Finding a right balance between these five criteria uh, becomes often uh, a nightmare for the procurement professionals. Uh, next slide, please. So what are the principles that uh, that we need to follow while while doing any public procurement, whether it's goods, whether it's works, whether it's consultancy or non-consultancy services? We broadly talk about five principles. One, we need to be transparent. We need to ensure that uh, whatever we do is is fair uh, and everybody is given equal rights. Uh, second, professionalism. We need to act as professionals. Uh, we we need to ensure that uh, we we offer the best level of services uh, at the same time. Also ensure that uh, whatever uh, process that we have set for ourselves, the uh, communication that we have, uh, ensure that we follow those professionalism principles. Third, broader obligations principle. The government of India has some broad obligations set up for itself. So any public procurement you do, make sure that you do not violate any of those uh, obligations. Whatever we do is in the broader obligations principle. Fourth, extrinsic legal principle. Uh, you need to ensure whatever at whatever time uh, you're doing public procurement it follows the rules of the land often they are documented in terms of uh, manuals in terms of rules and often you'll have the circulars that uh, various central ministers and departments uh, keep circulating so you need to ensure that you abide by those legal principles last but not the least and the most important one public accountability you are answerable uh, to to the citizens of this nation and uh, hence uh, whatever steps you take in public procurement make sure that um, you are fair, fair to the public. Uh, next slide, please. So, so setting up this ground rules for any public procurement. What are those documents which can give you a head start in public uh, in public procurement, and specifically talking about procurement of technical consultancy? Uh, we extensively use three documents. Uh, uh, whoever uh, I think uh, is a prof procurement professional will have this hard copies kept next right next to the table. Uh, so what is the first one? First one is GFR 2017. Uh, GFR was first introduced uh, uh, in 90s and then revised in 2005. And uh, now the latest one is GFR 2017. Uh, what you see on, on the left is, is basically a table of contents of GFR. Uh, probably in today's call, we'll, slide, we'll briefly cover procurement of services. Uh, and with the procurement of services, we'll talk about consultancy services. Um, Second uh, document, the one that you see at the middle is manual for procurement of consultancy and other services. Uh, this manual uh, further details down every rule that is provided in GFR 2017. It includes the uh, detailed templates. It talks about the procedures to be followed 
and uh, thereafter it will also uh, talk about do's and don'ts, exceptions, how do you manage that. Uh, the third document that you see on the right is the model request for proposals that was uh, released uh, in May 2006 by Department of Expenditure. Uh, while the document is 15 year old, but uh, it is as relevant as it was earlier. Uh, often uh, I discuss with my colleagues how some of those clauses are, are just beyond perfection. Uh, you, you will realize uh, when you start using model RFP and when you start implementing a particular project, how these clauses have been very well drafted. So, uh, those are the 3 documents that we extensively use in procurement of technical consultancy. Next slide please. Uh, talking about GFR 2017, uh, GFR uh, classifies the public procurement and th into 3 different categories. Works uh, rules 130 to 141 refer to that. So it includes original works. It includes minor works. It also includes repair works uh, associated with the former two. Then you have uh, procurement of goods, uh, which uh, uh, relate to rules 142 and 176. It talks about all uh, products, all goods, any software, uh, any integrated production process based machineries, all are covered in under procurement of goods. Talking about services, uh, GFR distinguishes uh, services into two different broad categories. One is consulting service, which uh, relates more to non-physical project specific uh, processes where the outcomes deliverables may change from one consultant to other. So when we talk about monitoring and evaluation based uh, professional services, uh, we are talking about consulting services there. Uh, thereafter, you have non-consulting services where they are largely physical, measurable, deliverables, outcomes based where uh, performance standards can be clearly identified and consistently applied. Uh, example here could be uh, uh, hiring of vehicle services or could be hiring of uh, 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 washer services, whatever. It could be, you know, one where the uh, performance standards are highly identified and, you know, consistently applied. So what we're going to talk about in next few slides is consulting services where M&E uh, falls into that domain. Next slide, please. Uh, so, yeah, we will be talking about rules 177 to 196. Uh, it is the uh, section 6 uh, sub chapter 2 uh, in terms of consultancy services. But while, uh, you know, there are specific rules which are defined for consultancy, but then uh, a lot of these clauses might not be repeated under uh, services or might not be repeated under work. So, although couched in the procurement of goods, some clauses are equally applicable to procurement of consultancy and other services. So, uh, just to carry out there. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, I know Neer is going to cover this slide in far more details, uh, but this is how a model RFP looks like. It has three clear sections, invitation for proposals, schedules, and appendices. Appendices is where we have all the templates. Uh, schedules is the is probably the brain of this model RFP. It includes terms of reference where we set expectations with the consultant and invitation for proposals. The very first section talks about uh, the procedure, the procurement process that the uh, bidding authority is going to follow to do this procurement process. So, uh, so this particular section A, invitation for proposals, has some very brilliantly drafted clauses when it comes to conditions of eligibility, uh, evaluation. Uh, talking about how key personnel will be substituted uh, and also project specific flexibility. Uh, some uh, some clauses might change from project to project. So this particular model RFP very brilliantly gives us that flexibility at the same time ensure standardization of our bid documents as Gulzar sir was talking about. One of the challenges that uh, we face in terms of public procurement. So we'll talk about this in far more details, but these are the three documents that we uh, extensively refer to in our procurement of technical consultancy. Next slide, please. Uh, so, talking about how does a typical procurement process looks like, uh, we'll first talk about the uh, open tender process. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so before we talk about uh, open tender process, we are talking about three uh, different modes of procurement. Often, uh, if you talk to uh, various professionals and government services, they would probably have heard about only open tender process. But there are also more other options that are available at your behest if you want to expedite procurement. So, what you see on the slide is uh, three different modes of procurement. Uh, procurement by nomination, procurement by empanelment or a limited tender process, and procurement by advertisement or an open tender process. Uh, so, as per GFR 2017, uh, if the budget is above 25 lakh rupees, you will have to go through an open tender process, open tender procurement process, which requires you to uh, have a, a thorough advertisement done. Uh, 
if your budget is less than 25 lakh rupees, you have an option to go through a limited tender process. A uh, limited tender process means you uh, do a uh, tendering with a limited set of institutions. Uh, that list of institutions could have been arrived based on empanelment or could have been arrived based on some formal informal queries or some rankings of central ministry departments. So if you can find a fair transparent way to find uh, those very qualified institutions, you can opt to go for consultancy by empanelment where the budget is less than 25 lakh rupees. The third option we have, and uh, it should be very selectively used, is the nomination-based procurement, where there isn't a real limit to it. Uh, it is governed by delegation of financial powers. Uh, but yes, in extreme exigencies, contingencies, uh, nomination-based route can also be followed. Uh, so uh, uh, what you see on the slide here is those three different types of procurement, and limited tender is one of the most um, least used. Uh, but we would pro probably uh, try to. Uh, encourage you to make more uh, use of limited tender process where you would have already done a part of uh, evaluation as part of the organizational appraisal when you do uh, empanelment. This will help you to uh, expedite the procurement process and reduce the overall time that goes into procurement. Uh, next slide, please. So how does a typical open tender procurement process looks like? This is where we talk about doing procurement through advertisement. Uh, so we, we start up with you know, preparing uh, a detailed terms of reference and RFE. So uh, again, these will help us understand how we go about drafting that RFE. Uh, so that's the most important part. If you do not get the terms of reference right, probably you'll struggle at the implementation stage. So it's important that you get uh, the expectations set up front in the terms of reference itself. Thereafter, you invite proposals. Uh, we have now moved 100% to central public procurement portal based e procurement. All our procurements are now done digitally, which has brought in far more transparency and accountability that we were talking about. Thereafter, uh, the uh, evaluation is done under the guidance of a technical evaluation committee. Uh, uh, and uh, again, it's, it's done in a very fair, transparent manner. Uh, once uh, technical evaluations is done, uh, the technically qualified proposals, we go ahead with financial evaluation and then uh, award the contract to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the highest scoring applicant. So that's broad open tender procurement process. Next slide, please. The limited tender process is very much similar to the open tender procurement process with only one uh, difference, uh, difference being shortlisting of the institutions upfront. Uh, so you can do shortlist of institutions based on any available uh, fair transparent uh, list. Uh, as I said, uh, we, we encourage you to go with empanelment of uh, route there. Uh, but once you have uh, shortlisted institutions, uh, then the uh, process is very much similar to open tender procurement process. Again, uh, while uh, uh, the GFR uh, allows uh, you to do all procurement uh, through CPP portal, uh, you will also need to uh, probably add this and panel institutions to your uh, selected list of institutions when, when you do a limited tender on CPP portal. Next slide, please. Uh, as I uh, now coming on to terms of reference, this is where I was talking about the brain of the RFP. Uh, over, uh, uh, over the last three years, we have tried to uh, play around with, you know, what are the key clauses that are needed? There is a structure that is also recommended by the model RFP. But what you see on this slide is pretty much uh, a broad outline of how a terms of reference should be. Start with talking about a background of your problem statement. Uh, why are you doing this particular public procurement? Thereafter, jump into objectives of the study. Uh, talk about the, the proposed methodology approach that you would want the uh, consultant to follow. Uh, then talk about scope of services. Scope of services is where uh, probably uh, if you get it right here, you will face uh, less of issues at the implementation stage. Uh, we will not have scope creep issues, typically uh, typical of any procurement that we do. Uh, because we are talking about monitoring evaluations, uh, primary data collection, uh, conducting KIIs with stakeholders becomes important. So that has dedicated chapters. Talk about your time schedule, deliverables, payment schedule, some base standard clauses. Uh, talk about how the report or the deliverables will look like, what support that uh, you will provide. And then towards the end, you can talk about review and governance structure. So this is broadly the terms of reference outline that we follow. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, so we have covered this. Uh, I'll leave it to Niri to talk about the model RFP. How do you create a model RFP? 
uh, based on uh, how do you create an RFP based on the model RFP template. So uh, we'll skip the slide for now. Next slide, please. Okay, so the, over the next couple of minutes, I'll quickly cover what uh, DMU has done to expedite the procurement process. I will not be able to go into far more details here, uh, but if you have any questions uh, after the uh, webinar, we will be happy to uh, help you out there. So talking about uh, what all initiatives has uh, DMU undertaken. Next slide, please. Uh, so broadly, these initiatives are bucketed into four uh, specific categories. The first one we have uh, released our guidelines for engagement of knowledge institutions. Uh, so this provides us uh, internal uh, uh, approvals based on how do we go about doing procurement. So that has reduced our time to procurement, get internal approvals of finance division and uh, from the competent authority. So the guidelines are very well uh, drafted. The three procurement processes that I spoke about, nomination, empanelment, and uh, open tender procurement process are very well documented and uh, procedures have been agreed internally already. So the second uh, initiative that we have started running is the empanelment part. We have already finished empanelment of survey institutions. So if we were to launch a survey um, uh, tomorrow, probably we can do a very uh, limited tender, either only just financial evaluation or techno plus financial evaluation and actually roll out the study in a couple of weeks time. Uh, the third uh, initiative that we have taken is standardization transparency. Uh, as I said, we have moved 100% to the digital CPP portal. We have standardized a lot of our templates so that it becomes easy for the bidder as well uh, when he sees consistency, the same set of procedures, the same set of forms. Uh, we have moved into uh, providing scanned PDF-based uh, uh, submission of forms to Excel-based forms. So it becomes easier for them to submit their responses, becomes easier for us to evaluate them. So those are certain steps that we have taken in terms of uh, standardization transparency. Last but not the least, we also want to take the whole ecosystem with us as we evolve in this journey. So we have created our own procurement toolkit. This procurement toolkit is available on DMU website. It's available, uh, the sessions on training are available on YouTube channels uh, so that all the states, districts, central ministries and departments can, uh, can take help from, from them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is uh, what uh, how the monitoring evaluation study guidelines looks like. It's a 20 page, a very brief document. It allows us to do three things. Uh, one is conduct studies and related surveys through the three model procurement uh, modes that we spoke about. It allows us to also do a desk based research, uh, allows us to reach out to individual consultants to help us uh, conduct studies. Uh, and last, it also allows us to do training and sensitization programs as far as it's within the broader framework of program objectives. Next slide, please. Uh, empanelment, uh, what you see on the slide is three different options available for empanelment. Uh, different ministries have reached out to different modes of empanelment uh, for their respective needs. So if you talk about RBI, they would probably empanel based on uh, rate per unit or, or fixed price empanelment. Uh, DMU has chosen to empanel survey institutions without agreeing on, e on any financials. So financials will be taken at the next uh, stage, which is project RFP. So the, the, the details of this procurement are available on the DMU website as well. Next slide, please. Uh, what you see on this slide is how the empanelment list looks like. So for survey institutions, we have a list of 28 institutions where we have classified them uh, by size of firm. So if you want to restrict your procurement only to MSMEs, you can do that, you can apply that filter. It takes care of the type of surveys, the experience that they have. Some of them you know, specialize in household establishment surveys, but some of them could uh, specialize in just KII. So uh, we have actually uh, categorized by type of surveys, uh, the 15 sectors where they have previous experience in, states where they have presence today, and last, uh, based on their technical scores, we have graded them as well. So this list is available on DMU website. Uh, it, it is available for all states, uh, all central ministries departments to uh, leverage that for the limited tender process. Next slide, please. Uh, pro probably uh, the second last slide. Uh, this is giving a snapshot of the procurement toolkit, which is available on the DMU website. As I spoke about all the model RFP documents, the guidelines, the samples, the templates, for that matter, uh, seven session recordings to walk you through how to use these templates is also available on DMU website. Next slide, please. Uh, I was talking about the seven sessions. Uh, this is uh, how the curriculum looks like. It starts from introducing you to government rules and procedures, then jumping on to how do you draft a TOR, how do you draft an RFP, 
and then gets into limited and then open tender procurement process. Uh, this gets a little trivial by using, uh, because we make use of CPP portals, there are detailed user guidelines also available on as part of the toolkit. So as I said, this is available on for consumption on the DMU website and on the YouTube channel as well. Next slide, please. Uh, last but not the least, often uh, in any government uh, uh, procedures, it's very important to get the segregation of duties done. Uh, that's why we leverage here the RACI metrics where all the steps, and if I remember correctly, this talks about close to 180 dot odd steps, uh, just to ensure that we do not miss any of them. Uh, so this, uh, this document is also available on our DMU website. It clearly talks about, uh, at least for DMU, what are the steps that we follow and who is accountable, who is responsible, who has to be consulted or informed at various stages and do's and don'ts. Often during the experience, you realize that, you know, that there should be few things that you should have not done. There are a few things that you should have done. A very trivial as, you know, no, do not mark the recipients in uh, two or CC if there are a long distribution list probably put to them in BCC. So to that level, we have tried to capture them in the SOP. Uh, so that is uh, briefly talking about all the TMUs experience in the last uh, two and a half, three years that we have been able to create in procurement of technical consultancy. We don't say we are experts. Uh, we are still learning. Um, and But yes, uh, we hope that you also can uh, probably uh, leverage few of these documents as, as you start this journey uh, in your respective states or districts. Uh, with that, uh, I pass it over back to you, DG, sir. Yeah, uh, thanks, Suresh, for the very interesting presentation. Um, and now I would request uh, uh, Ms. Nidhi Arora to uh, make a presentation uh, on best practices in procurement and adoption of model RFP in procurement of uh, technical consultancy. The floor is yours, Nidhi. Th uh, thank you, Dr. Bonusa. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. It's uh, particularly wonderful to be here, you know, interacting with states uh, on this subject matter, what I regard as uh, extremely more than central to the functioning or functionality of the whole concept of governance, uh, particularly because we're talking about monitoring and evaluating the public fund that we spend in terms of policy and programs. So I think this is one of the most uh, key elements that we need to check ourselves and uh, work on. So um, I'm, the presentation I'm going to make, the next four or five slides, uh, of course, uh, aiming to be in the time given, uh, is sort of a deep dive into a lot what uh, Paresh has covered, but uh, we are just going to uh, go deeper into the whole um, idea of the uh, bidding process uh, and uh, how it can be more relevant or, or what kind of practices make it more relevant for monitoring and uh, evaluation services, keeping in mind the uh, ideas let down in the model documents. So um, if you find certain uh, bullets repetitive, just bear with me because they will lead to a larger point, which hopefully is not repetitive. So, um, of course, uh, you know, in, in introduction to this particular webinar and of course in the preceding presentations, uh, we've gotten the idea of uh, how important or critical it is a responsibility of state government to uh, monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of public expenditure. And of course, uh, We've uh, done a deeper understanding of uh, the challenges that are faced by the state governments in uh, giving effect to these evaluations, be it in-house or, you know, when they try to engage it through uh, third party consultants, etc. So uh, the way the way I see it or the way we see it is that uh, this entire concept of uh, ME procurement has to be in two parts. One is, of course, the selection process. And the other equally important is the contract management, because uh, the idea is that one is, of course, emphasizing on getting reputable, credible, effective parties on board, consultants on board to do the job. And then, of course, monitor how the job is being done. So uh, the first aspect being implementing a fair and transparent bidding process. Uh, into the details of this, uh, that your RFP needs to specify certain important elements such as conditions of eligibility, terms of reference, etc., and pre specifying criteria for evaluation. Most importantly, it needs to include a draft consultancy agreement in the RFP itself so that before the parties submit their bids, their intention to participate, etc., they know what conditions would apply to them over the years that they are, over the months that they are delivering these services. 
Uh, I'm going to touch on the GFR to make a larger point here. Uh, while, of course, um, the uh, uh, effectiveness of uh, quality and cost-based system is uh, very well accepted across the board, but there are uh, there are certain areas or there are certain uh, you know procurement agencies which perhaps uh, can uh, uh, make use of this discussion once again that how a, a QCBS, a quality and cost-based system, uh, is preferable, advisable for M&E consultancy services compared to a least cost system or clinically known as the L1 mechanism. GFR talks about both uh, these systems and a couple of other uh, um, uh, methods of selection which Parish touched upon, but uh, stating the obvious, um, QCBS is something which needs to be absolutely kept in mind when quality of consultancy is of prime concern. The delicate balance that this particular system tries to achieve between uh, technical capacity or, or, the, or the technical uh, qualifications of your consultant and the cost at which they are willing to do. So for that delicate balance, it's very important to keep coming back to this as the method. The least cost system according to GFR is of course relevant, but more so for standard or routine nature assignments, because this system does not give any weightage to technical scores. Next slide, please. So um, I'm just going to take a deeper dive into uh, what actually is the quality and cost based selection? Of course, we'll take a further deep dive when we talk about how it is covered in the model RFP. Very simply put, uh, I think Paresh was in his uh, roadmap for a procurement that he was talking about. He's covered this uh, quality and cost based selection actually looks at the technical score and the financial score of the applicants and then combines the two. Uh, to arrive at the highest scorer who then becomes your selected applicant or your consultant to deliver the job. Now, what is important to remember here is that the GFR gives this particular flexibility that while in a QCBS system, it's important to give more weightage to technical aspects, but there is uh, some kind of uh, um, a range of, let's say, between 60 and 80 percent that can be played with in terms of the technical aspects of the project or the assignment at hand. Uh, once again, stating the obvious uh, on the second bullet that you see on your slide is uh, very, very important because it kind of highlights why QCBS is important, why QCBS needs to be preferred and what is it that least cost system fails to deliver or the unwanted, unwarranted results that it ensues. So we've already covered that where you're looking at highly specialized, non-repetitive and non-standard services, it is important to um, adjudge the experience, expertise and competence of the consultant. More importantly, where you're only looking at a, uh, the cost being quoted, there is a very, very real chance of uh, the assignment being awarded to an inferior or perhaps even incompetent consultant. So uh, the reason why this particular uh, conclusion gets occasioned is because a consultant who plans to execute the job in a certain qualitative manner, deploying a certain quality of resources, will not be able to, or rather will, be, will lose out to someone uh, or, or who does not plan to deliver that kind of quality in a price competition. Because his product, his services to you would be more expensive compared to someone who is planning to execute in a slightly uh, inferior manner, if I may use the words. And of course, the chances of abnormally low, low, low bids are a very, very real possibility in a lease cross process. So uh, it is worthy here, you know, that the economic survey also quoting a CVC paper said that while L1 or lease cost process may still hold good for procurement of routine works, goods and non-consulting services, but not for high impact and technologically complex procurements. Next slide, please. So this is the promised tour of the model RFP, at least from you know our perspective as to uh, why the document, though I take the point made in the earlier presentation, that it could be a challenge to uh, ad adopt a standardized document for a custom transaction. But uh, I concede to Parish's point here that uh, the way this document is designed uh, with a little bit of work, it can definitely be adopted and would lead to the envisioned results. So uh, very quickly, the document deploys QCBS system. And uh, it is important to note here that back in 2009, when it was issued by the Department of Expenditure, it was a result of an ex 
extensive interministerial consultation uh, and across the board uh, discussion with stakeholders and experts. So uh, while, of course, uh, largely uh, issued for adoption by the central government uh, ministries and entities, but uh, this particular document can be adopted by the state governments as a best practice document. It is important to mention here that, you know, the principles of uh, public procurement that Parish was talking about, uh, this particular document embodies, lives and breathes them in terms of transparency, fairness, cost effectiveness, and very importantly, elimination of conflict of interest, which is extremely critical to a transparent and accountable procurement process. The document is generic in nature, but at the same time, it has a lot of flexibility to include and write project specific aspects. And there are uh, footnotes that guide you through the process of making those changes to a very large extent. And of course, this is my favorite feature of the document, the fact that it actually uh, goes to the next step of uh, ensuring there's a structure for even monitoring of services after the award of assignment. Uh, the model RFE talks in terms of uh, the first feature, of course, which is prominent to the document is that while it seeks one proposal, but there are two aspects to it, that of a technical bid and a financial bid. Parish has gone into this, but I'm just going to quickly mention that uh, technical bid is all about establishing the eligibility, just about the information that he needs to put, the applicant needs to put to confirm their compliance with conditions of eligibility. The financial bid is where they tell you the money or the cost or the price that it will take for them to deliver the job. Uh, the conditions of eligibility, I think, are the heart and soul of this document, you know, after the consultancy agreement, of course, because you see, this is what sets the path of the kind of consultant you will get on board. So while it while it'll take me, it may take a lot of effort to come up with the technical capacity or the financial capacity best suited to your project, but it's worth the effort. And the model RFP has the broader structure in which this can be put in along with guiding footnotes. So list the eligible assignments that you want the consultant to have done in the past, uh, list it in terms of the nature, the number of assignments, the value of those assignments in terms of cost, etc. Very importantly, talk about the financial capacity. Uh, the point made in the earlier presentation is well taken that um, this is a uh, when defining the minimum financial capacity or the minimum income that the person, the applicant should have received, you know, uh, from professional fee as a threshold. A call needs to be taken as to the kind of uh, applicant pool uh, that you want to uh, let participate in the process. So, depending on that, you keep it lower, you keep it higher. Again, the model document with the foot footnotes guides you, guides you through the process. The third important aspect of eligibility, of course, remains, and which I think is very, very, very essential to this kind of an assignment of m &E, because it is the people that come on board to do the job that determine how the job will get done. So list out the key personnel that you need mandatorily to be on the job, list their qualifications and their past assignment. Next slide, please. In the second slide of the features of RFP and the last one for my presentation, we are just going to talk about a few other features. Terms of reference. Now, um, I think enough has been said and the term has actually come up quite a bit in the last hour. Now, uh, while of course, you know, Parish covered in great detail as to what all you need to write, one reason why it is important to nail this absolutely correctly is because this is what actually determines your financial bids. It is very important that all the applicants participating in the process to the extent possible have a uniform understanding, a, a comparable understanding of the work that they need to deliver. Because that would to a very large extent ensure that their financial bids are co competitive and comparable in a way we want them to be. So again, a very important aspect to get right in your RFP. Once again, model RFP guides you through the process. I understand that it is difficult or other challenges may come in adapting it for your own transaction, but with the broad headings that Parish mentioned and the model lays down, filling it up though difficult uh, is worth the time. This second last feature of the RFP that I want to talk about is the evaluation process. So, uh, the idea being that open open the pool of applicants as large as you can, 
but shortlist them in terms of their technical competencies and then take them with you to the next stage of the financial evaluation. So in the first stage, when the technical bids are opened, the only responsive bids which have a minimum score should be taken to the next round. Model lays down an indicative weightage for the firm experience, the proposed methodology, and the key personnel. But of course, the same can be altered to some extent. It is advised that no more than five applicants should be shortlisted for financial evaluation. But again, a call that uh, a model has, you know, the due guiding notes to let you take the number higher or lower. So in the second stage, a very important one, the financial bids are open, where you then score the financial quotes made. So the, the way it works is that the person quoting, the applicant quoting the lowest gets 100, and then as is the central scheme of evaluation under this RFP, it's all relative marking. So at any given point in time, your benchmark is set by the highest submission, which could be the lowest financial quote or highest number or quality of the eligible assignment. So by doing this relative marking, then you come to arrive at the total score, where the total score is a product rather is a product of addition, adding the technical score and the financial score multiplied by their respective weights. When laying down or mapping the selection, you rank the proposals according to their combined scores. Selected applicant typically is your highest combined scorer. The RFP lays down the procedure should such a person not be able to accept the assignment, then what happens, etc. And further, uh, you know, it furthers other scenarios that could be relevant to the period between selection and awarding of the contract. The following is the last item in my presentation, and I think I touched upon the importance of it in the very first slide, that this is one of the best features of the model RFP, because getting a consultation agreement right is very, very critical. And most of the terms and conditions of this kind of an agreement are standard or boilerplate. So model helps you in uh, adopting those boilerplate tried and tested best of international practices oriented terms and conditions, you know, in terms of uh, parties obligations, how you can make a modification to the scope of work should the occasion show, so arise, permitted change of key personnel, because at the end of the day, you know, in a longer contract, not everything can be foreseen, but or it can be rightly addressed should uh, it so arise. There are damages and penalties that are being talked about dispute resolution being talked about. So, um, uh, although not mentioned here, but a critical aspect is that the term of reference that you include in the RFP, which lays down the services, the deliverables, the payment, etc., it all becomes a part of your consulting consultancy agreement eventually. So, uh, this again is very rightly connected to the whole idea of after you've awarded the contract, your work as the project authority, procurement agency, you know, government entity, your work actually starts because getting getting the right kind of deliverables is equally our responsibility as well as that of the consultant delivering it. So uh, that will be all from my side, uh, DG sir. Thank you. Thank you, Nidhi, for uh, excellent presentation. Uh, for everyone uh, who's on the call, uh, when we started, uh, doing our procurement for 125 uh, centrally sponsored schemes uh, simultaneously through 10 packages. Nidhi and uh, Leod Sanjay Saha, um, who used to work at the time in Niti Aayog, uh, provided extensive support. Uh, and uh, slowly with their initial support, we built our internal capabilities and Nidhi continues to support us. So uh, uh, it's... Guess. It's possible for institutions to start at a very base level and slowly build, build. And then, of course, uh, efforts have to be made to retain that knowledge within that institution. So one thing that we are trying to do uh, in DMO is to build uh, procurement capabilities, understanding across all the staff who are in DMO, uh, close to uh, 80 staff. And they are all engaged in some or other part of the uh, procurement, given its importance. Now, with this, uh, I will now request Dr. Basavaraju to uh, talk about the role of partnerships at state level and way forward. Uh, Basavaraju, your floor is yours. Uh, at the outset, uh, uh, thank you, sir, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm, great, I'm greatly indebted to all the support DMU is uh, bestowing on GRA. 
under your leadership and the Niti Aayog team. Uh, uh, my apologies, I don't have a, a presentation, sorry, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, I was asked to speak on partnership. So, uh, partnership should be built not based on power, it's, it should be built based on uh, recognition, responsibility and respect. So, with this, I'll go to my uh, you know, presentation today. Uh, it was wonderful to hear uh, uh, the Gulzar Natarajan's uh, presentation. It was very apt and he was raising many issues from the uh, you know, procurer's perspective. I feel my sharing today would answer some of his uh, questions as well as uh, I would say, uh, you know, uh, as uh, taking cue from Paresh's uh, you know, presentation, it should be right. Yeah, but it should be right for both, both uh, to the state as well as to the partner. So then only the power partnership is sustainable. I understand partnership is all about complementing strengths. Each one of us bring strength uh, to the table. So it has to be complemented. It has to be taken forward in a cohesive manner. It's all about, uh, as we say in management, win-win. So both we should come out with a, a wonderful evaluation, output and outcome. So, a sustained partnership for policy augmentation. Government, policy think tanks, academic institution, and more importantly, civil society organizations need to increasingly work together for creating PPP, I quote. I don't mean public-private partnership here. I mean pro-people, participatory, and plural public policy. Plural, I'm using as an adjective here, which is diversity, inclusion, and affirmative public policy. So uh, when only all these pillars of development, public policy come together, we can envisage a wonderful evidence-based policy making milieu in our country, I believe. The, uh, you may ask why partnership in the evaluation space? Normally, uh, we have heard partnership for implementing public programs. But why it is all the more important in the evaluation, research, and policy making, uh, uh, you know, uh, affairs actually. But before coming into the qualitative aspects of, uh, uh, you know, the advantages, let me put up some num numbers in front of you. Uh, as uh, uh, you know, uh, Shaker sir was, uh, you know, uh, uh, quoting our experience of uh, supporting Karnataka government in creating Karnataka Evaluation Authority. Uh, uh, thanks to the government for giving that opportunity to Gram. Uh, before creating the Karnataka Evaluation Authority, the department used to do an average of four to five evaluations per year. But after establishing an exclusive authority, on an average, 25 studies are being done every year. So that is uh, something you can say almost 500 uh, percent uh, increase, uh, you can say. But is government investing a lot of resources, uh, human, especially human resources for deriving this outcome, sorry, deriving this output. I don't, uh, it's not uh, no, correct actually if you are guessing. It's uh, 15 to 16 professionals, technical professionals are involved, of course, around equal number of administrative staffs are also there in the authority, but with 15 to 16 professionals, they are managing this uh, volume. That's something you need to recognize, number one. Secondly, if you say if they were to do all the evaluations themselves, even you take at least five people should have invested their time in for each study, not less than 125 people are required. Understand how financially it is beneficial to the state having partnership for evaluations. Coming to the qualitative aspects of uh, you know advantages through partnership, one is it, it brings in thematic knowledge. Uh, public policies, as we all understood, is a multidisciplinary and multidimensional actually. And you need to have multidisciplinary people to participate in evaluation uh, activity. And, we, and their time is not always required. We don't get to do evaluation of different disciplines, different domain all the times. It is all you know, time specific. So you don't need to invest on them full time, but you can still avail their services when you need. That's the advantage of partnership. Secondly, most importantly, it is field experience they bring in. 
normally these partners are not just on the other side of the table that is only making policies or developing programs they are the beneficiaries of the program they would be observing its implementation in the field that's add a lot of value and dimension when the evaluation design is expected to be developed and more importantly the partners grassroots leakages data collection becomes key and easy i tell my own example actually so we uh, because we come from a not for profit uh, domain the civil society organizations domain so we have a grassroots network of ngos in each district it can even we can go up to the block level so wherein the data collectors need not have to move from outside so the cultural uh, understanding uh, the local language everything is taken care when you work with grassroots knowledge of course it comes with little more responsibility of equipping them to uh, uh, no, do a data collection job and fourth is the ability to rope in required subject matter specialists it's not so easy for government to immediately procure some uh, you know subject matter specialist or expert services but it is easy once it is given to the partner organization they can exercise uh, you know those uh, you know responsibilities to avail these uh, services and most importantly as we all expect the evaluation should be unbiased because it's going to be a third party completely somebody not who is the party in the whole program implementation would be evaluating the uh, you know evaluation no the specific program or policy it brings up that research neutrality there is no biased uh, you know uh, opinion towards uh, the either to project a program positively or negatively and multiple studies can be done at the same time as i already explained through uh, you know evidence and numbers you can do multiple studies at the same time uh, you know uh, ensuring uh, optimal utilization of both resource you know, hr and as well as uh, time available and quality evaluation outputs can be derived if state works with partners how it is actually uh, the authorities or the units will have more time to facilitate and monitor otherwise they would become doers there is no time to review or monitor and can take critical review of methodology and reports uh, from uh, time to time and diverse expertise unlike research evaluate like unlike research studies this evaluation requires programmatic as well as pragmatic insights in both policy as well as at the grassroots level issues so for example if you ask me if i why some health in health system people are not participating uh, actually the policy expects them to be a active part of uh, all this uh, you know uh, uh, you know people participation committees actually is jan arogya samiti or arogya raksha samitis so to tell answer your question pragmatically it requires to have an expertise and experience at the field level also from the grassroots perspective but creating this partnership is not so easy as uh, you know nidhi ji was also exp you know, explaining that uh, you know if you go with only financial criteria uh, we may get uh, the media core organizations quoting less uh, budget and grabbing those uh, you know uh, contracts and that's what happening in our experiences also you might be knowing karnataka came out with evaluation policy in uh, 2000 actually so that means uh, uh, what state expected or mandated is every scheme which with uh, the budget outlay of more than 1 crore should be evaluated by an external agency during the plan period that was uh, in brief uh, the policy was all about but since there was too many programs with an outlay of more than 1 crore it was envisaged that each line department would select at least one key plan or non plan scheme for evaluation continuously that means there was need for suddenly for the planning department the volume increased there was a need for uh, you know more organization uh, and partners were felt but where are they until then never thought about uh, partner developing partnership base understanding uh, the competencies of different institutions in the state etc but the question started actually need was the major reason for karnataka's evaluation manual or you know partnership evaluation man, you know evaluation empanelment manual actually so but there were specific difficulties were encountered by the department also in procuring suitable agencies and undertaking for evaluations there was no specific specific criteria to empanel agencies for conducting evaluations so also there was any agency could have empaneled 
and bid for an assignment irrespective of having required qualification also it was just kind of an you know empanelment not by you know going through seriously their criteria it is just based on their basic existence some you know key turnovers etc so limiting factor was that the expected outputs of evaluation of services was also not amenable to the tangible standards and smaller organizations uh, and consulting agencies you know uh, often were underbidding and compared to established uh, research institutions and of course it con you know, contributed to substandard uh, reports uh, for all these reasons there was again the government thought and uh, to create an evaluation authority and have systems and processes developed and you know uh, uh, engage agencies but how as as one of the major challenge for us was like how to you know compare apple to apple the present policy was actually we were comparing sometimes apple to orange apple to banana various things actually so there has to be a unifast first of all we you know we thought we will empanel we will screen the agencies based on all the administrative criteria we'll just do the screening and do the desk review of that organization to understand their competency suitability etc and reject at that level so once it is rejected they can only apply after one year uh, time actually they need to work on the their limitation and only they can come back for empanelment after one year so once the desk review was completed the process uh, we followed was to like do a field validation but sometime unfortunately that was skipped by the state actually field validation required a lot of independent assessors also because there was no government machinery to go to organization physically understand and verify whether the organization is you know having all those resources they claim actually that was subsequently skipped but uh, then after that it will go to an evaluation committee with the combined score both uh, the application what they submitted as well as the score given by independent assessor then either the application was rejected or next you no know, uh, submitted to the grading and intimation processes and there was a provision for queries and grievance redresser was also created and then finally the empanelment committee will choose the partners empanel them and certify them what they expected to do uh, was also was uh, actually to recognize their technical and thematic competency like whether they are expert in energy sector whether they are expert in education sector or health sector number one empanel by uh, theme wise number one number two is give them a class or grade actually grade them based on their you know uh, the score either they are a category organization or b category organization so initial expectation and thought uh, in the authority while we are all you know designing uh, its architecture was so when the tendering was issued it should go to, like as parish was mentioning it, it's a limited tender issued for particular class and thematic expertise the organization's pool actually it was only released then so if it is a very large study probably you need to cover if you at the state level if you are to cover some 5000 10000 samples do a multi district uh, study uh, then you only issue that uh, you know tender to uh, class a or class b organizations so that when they when because their technical competencies their hr competencies already assessed then you are comparing between only that particular class of organization but unfortunately that was saturated uh, subsequently at the implementation level so this is in nutshell uh, the you know the uh, policy the initial empanelment policy uh, developed and you know empaneled the organization it was almost like a 120 day 120 day affair like from starting application to you know disseminating list of empanelment agencies 120 days uh, process was uh, you know uh, timeline was envisaged what was the advantages beyond just you know quality report was working with government for policy and program change these agencies they uh, you know they continue their activity because normally the agencies are working in that particular domain in that thematic area the evalu even uh, evaluation would only add the art to their bo body of knowledge they would continue to uh, advocate for policy or program change work with the state they're part of various committees inside the state whatever the knowledge and expertise they generate out of the evaluation study would continuously contribute towards a better policy in the state then publishing papers dissemination of knowledge that is one of the major limitation we have now 
so uh, not allowed because we if you are doing uh, you know a study as part of the government not allowed to publish papers all the times so but when you work in the partners along with the partners they could be based on mutual consent the papers can be published and it can be disseminated that's another important thing and contribution to again policy development the development thinking and in the reviews of government policies that would really you know uh, contribute in a long way but coming to the last portion of my presentation or sharing way forward what we need to do either at the state level it may be or at the uh, national level i'm strongly and i advocate for you know empanelment by their categorization the category of organization uh, uh, you know should be created so that uh, you know there could be a fair uh, con you know uh, uh, competition as well as fair comparison also that's number one Secondly, empanelment with thematic area of expert experience and expertise. Right now, what we have even in Karnataka is anybody can apply for any thematic or any domain study, whether they have HR, whether they have internal capability, whether they have worked in past, that's secondary, but they can uh, apply at least, uh, you know, add more burden to the, you know, uh, uh, screening committee to go through their uh, papers and uh, do administrative, increase administrative works. And Creating independent pool of assessors is very much required so that we can do a better output grading of evaluation report. In Karnataka, Gram also came out with uh, an output grading report to just to evaluate the evaluation report actually, how you will say whether the evaluation report is good, bad or average. So, uh, uh, but to do that, we need subject matter specialists. A pool of assessors are required to be created and more importantly, capacity development, we need to invest on capacity development, creating an evaluation community. We have researchers, but not evaluators quite often. So we need to invest on developing their capabilities and evaluation in that should be brought in at the design stage, actually at the program design stage. It's not why when all the implementation is completed, then we think about evaluation. The theory of change and lock frame should be an integral part of the program plan. So unless we do that, there's always be a confusion as well as, uh, you know, a conflict between the state and the partner organization. So we understand and uh, interpret output and outcome differently. State or some other may understand output, outcome and impact differently. So the, uh, the you know, the, in, you know, variables we use or in this index we create that could completely different actually. And Equity in empanelment is something required to be ensured. Financial turnover, or turnover quite often is one of the criteria to empanel agencies. But if you take the, uh, uh, you know, not-for-profit organizations, uh, uh, you know, uh, the basic principles or ethos, it's a misplaced metric. So normally the cost, budget, turnover of not-for-profit organization always lesser than a for-profit organization because for-profit uh, uh, organization incorporated with lot of you know the funds actually either there is uh, you know some entity invest or uh, you know initial capital raised and created but normally not for profit organization created without any capital with lot of passion and commitment to do something so should be at least equity ensured in uh, financial metric when it comes so Raju, i think we are running out of time uh, we have uh, come to the last one. yeah Yes, and IT architecture for empanelment evaluation is something very important. Integrating uh, AI, many things can be eased. Output grading, evaluation announcements, and dashboard, everything can be uh, taken care of with that. So I'll stop my uh, yeah. sharing and presentation. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Baswaraju. Uh, very, very illuminating. I request all the departments uh, to visit the Karnataka Evaluation Authority website and also Grams website. They have done uh, really uh, very, very impressive work on systematizing uh, procurement. With this now, I request my colleague uh, Ruhani from Indian Economic Services to uh, lead us through the Q&A session. Uh, Ruhani asked me only easy questions. Thank you, sir. So let's start uh, with the last section of this webinar, the Q&A session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box. So uh, let's start with a question uh, for Paresh for from Parmeshwaram D. So uh, Mr. Parmeshwaram D is asking why technical evaluation is required for limited tender when you have impaneled based, based on technical capacity only. Paresh. 
thanks, thanks, Rani. Uh, so, in, in empanelment, what we end up doing is, is organizational evaluation, but, but any evaluation also includes analysis. So, uh, when once the empanelment is done, as part of limited tender, you have two options. You can go ahead with just financial evaluation, uh, the, but go ahead with uh, lowest cost selection because the technical evaluation is already done. But often we also are uh, want to check the team that is going to be uh, deployed on the respective project, which probably is not evaluated at the time of empanelment because we are not even sure of what team members are needed. So if the project requires uh, evaluation of the key personnel, then you might have to do a abridged technical evaluation plus financial evaluation. But if you feel uh, there's no need for key personnel evaluation. You can go ahead with just uh, financial evaluation uh, and on, on a lowest cost selection basis. Rohani, back to you. Thanks, Paresh. So, next question is for Gulzar, sir. Uh, so, sir, Tanvi is asking can the GFR be adopted by states and how can it be customized as per the requirement of states? Request your thoughts, Gulzar. So, uh, thanks. Thank you. Just once. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, ultimately state governments uh, procurement policies, uh, be it on consulting services or goods and services, goods and works are drawn from the GFR and several state governments have customized, uh, and developed their own policy documents. But then, like, uh, the whole challenge here is in the specific case of, uh, technical consulting services in con services in general and more particularly m and &E evaluation services. Uh, we need to go beyond the, uh, the general contours laid out in the GFR and develop specific documents which can be applied for the specific task uh, of uh, hiring these consulting services. So the, the, the answer, the, the, la the, that's the sort of a, long answer to it but then state governments do customize it uh, customize the gfr for their purposes thank you sir the so next question is from mr pavan kumar uh, parish can take probably take up this question nowadays all procurements are to be done through gem there are many startup companies listed and having exemption certificate from msc msme or any other authority such companies do not have proper exposure in respective fields. Please explain what to do when such companies participate in bids because at technical stage, it is difficult to qualify due to having exemption certificate. Parish? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, Ruhani. I'll, I'll try to answer that. And maybe if you have any additional points to add, please, please feel free to chip in. Um, so, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, whenever we are giving relaxations to MSMEs, it's largely under conditions of eligibility, which means we have some prior turnover requirements or prior experience requirements. We can relax that for MSMEs or startups. But when it comes to evaluation, where we are looking at the quality per se, there I think uh, we follow a very impartial view. Uh, where we might probably startups might be given some X percentage higher weighted, let's say, whatever, if they score uh, 70, we might enhance it by 10%. We can have such clauses put into the RFP evaluation, but that does not mean you give a blanket uh, yes to any quality that you receive from MSME. So there has to be a balance between encouraging MSME startups, but not compromising on quality per se. So that should be uh, my response to that query. Uh, Nidhi, if you would like to add anything there. Right. Uh Two quick things. One is uh, principally, uh, let us always remember that whatever we want to apply should be pre-specified. So it is very important that bigger firms participating are also aware that a certain uh, 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 leverage or a certain relaxation or exemption is being given to participants who fulfill a certain credential. So that's principal part of it. The second aspect is again, it all depends on the nature of the assignment we want to get done. So, for example, if there is an assignment where certain number of years of experience or presence is important purely as a function of having done more of that work, right? Well, in those cases, of course, we need not unnecessarily encourage participation because we know that we want someone, you know, to be uh, of a certain standing to take part or to partake in that particular assignment. So there one should avoid. But yes, wherever possible, um, 
keep the financial capacity, etc., low enough that you encourage a wider and a varying pool. And then you take your pick in terms of, uh, you know, um, uh, evaluate, uh, evaluation, etc. But yes, always remember whatever it is that you want to apply, pre specify, apply it uniformly so that there's no advantage that given, uh, you know, in terms of not being pre specified. Thanks, Nidhi. Back to Rwani. Thanks, Nidhi and Paresh. So, uh, next question uh, is from Mr. Ravinder, uh, directed to Nidhi, ma'am. So, ma'am, can a government, semi government organization or company allowed to give works by nominations directly? Nidhi, ma'am? Well, um, you know, so considering I dedicated an entire um, slide to why QCBS and why not L1, so I'll have to take this very delicately and uh, sort of, you know, under uh, the arching uh, principles of the GFR, uh, whether they be applicable or, you know, be the guiding document, depending on whether you're in the central government or the state. So I'm going to borrow the answer straight from the GFR uh, rule. Uh, 194, as I understand, deals with it. And it lays out these exceptional circumstances, and I'm going to emphasize on the word exceptional again, where you can uh, give an assignment by nomination or a single source selection. So um, the first condition it says is that where it represents a natural continuation of previous work carried out by the firm. So let's say a consultant has already done certain work for you, and the new assignment is a natural continuation of it. So that's one situation. The second one being of emergency, natural disasters, etc. You know, where timely completion is of utmost importance. And when I'm saying these words, they come directly from the GFR. The emphasis may be mine, but the language is that of the rules. The third scenario is where you know that the work that you want to get delivered is proprietary in nature. Yeah, the ownership of that particular technique or technology belongs to a consultant. So there is no point in opening up, you know, the market to uh, other consultants because they'll not qualify for evaluation also. So that's your third scenario. The fourth scenario is, you know, where there's adequate justification available for nomination in the context of the interest of the ministry or the department. Uh, I would say one of the most general scenarios or circumstances, but here, Remember that you will need the approval of the competent authority if your uh, single source falls under this particular category. The fifth and a very critical one is that in a situation where the procuring entity can ensure fairness and equity, particularly if they can ensure that the prices are reasonable and consistent with market rates for tasks of a similar nature. As in, you know, where they can establish that they need not derive the price competitively and that through nomination, the price that they're getting for the services is at par with the market rates. They can uh, go for single source selection or consultancy by nomination. Once again, this was rule 194 of the GFR 2017. So I would request the person asking the question to do go through the rule for the full elaborate version. Thank you so much, Nidhi, ma'am. Uh... Pleasure. And uh, next, I think we have a question uh, which DG sir can probably take up. This is a question from Mr. Malaya Mohanty. So he's asking, suppose we opt for limited tender where budget is less than 25 lakhs. However, the consultant proposes financial bid more than 25 lakh, which is exceptionally high. Should we cancel the limited tender or go for it? What may be the limit beyond 25 lakh that we can consider? In case of urgent need, can we exceed the limit of 25 lakhs to go for limited tender with approval of competent authority? Did you, sir, request your views? Thanks, uh, Rohan. Uh, so uh, basically, the financial proposal, uh, when uh, because uh, all the conditions are put ahead of uh, bidding process, so we have already stated that the maximum uh, bid will be 25 lakh. Uh, so any uh, financial quotes above that uh, maximum limit would uh, automatically become uh, non-responsive. So uh, clearly uh, the procurement process, if at all everyone bids above 25 lakh, then you have to uh, go for rebidding. Uh, uh, but as far as the 25 lakh ceiling is concerned, uh, the uh, Department of Expenditure has authority uh, to in general or in a specific case, 
increase the uh, limit. Uh, that's one. The second is uh, the state governments, when they're adopting the GFNIR, they can also consider inflation and others. And in some specific cases, they can also give higher limits uh, under the limited tender process. Um, so that's, uh, uh, I think, how we can handle this uh, part. Thanks. Thank you, Dee sir. So next question we have uh, for Parish. Uh, so Parish, is there a possibility of considering a QBS mode of selection where the budget becomes secondary and you get a quality work and output from the project monitored or evaluated? Please advise. This is done in a few ADB or World Bank projects globally and in India also. This is a question from Mr. Madhusudan Hanu Mappa. So Parish, could we request your views, please? Uh, thanks, Rani, and thanks, Madhusudanji, for, for that suggestion. Actually, uh, in the latest recent guidelines that Department of Expenditure has released, they have actually suggested uh, a new mode of procurement going forward. They call it not QBS, they call it FBS, Fixed Budget Based Selection, which means uh, the budget is already decided. It, uh, at the time before uh, requesting for proposals. So if the budget you feel is uh, 40 lakh rupees, that budget is already decided, then the award of project is purely done based on quality. So based on the technical scores or uh, the evaluation of the technical proposals is how that would be done. So uh, to short answer to Mulsu Denji, your question, yes, we can go ahead with uh, uh, QBS. Uh, we call it fixed based, uh, fixed budget based selection. And yes, uh, their 100% uh, marks is only to quality. Yeah, back to you, Rwani. And thank you so much, Paresh. So, uh, next question is for Nidhi, ma'am, from Mr. Pawan Kumar. So, ma'am, could you please explain the process to hire government agencies as consultants or contractors for survey work on nomination basis, whether it can be done through single source? Please let us know. I think uh, I just covered it. Would you like me to repeat? So we just we just went through the rule 194 of the GFR, which talks about single source uh, and uh, nomination. So right. I can ask you, do, would you like me to repeat it? And for the benefit of the audience, you, you can. I'll do that, certainly. My pleasure, my pleasure. So very quickly, um, like I was saying that, of course, uh, um, not to be the preferred choice, but uh, the GFR, uh, lays down some exceptional circumstances in which you can go for nomination or single source consultancy. But I'll go through the five exceptional circumstances with a rider that uh, a case needs to be made, or rather a very thorough case needs to be made for which of these five circumstances you can fall under. The first situation or circumstance in which you can go for engaging uh, a consultant through nomination is when the work that you want get done is a natural continuation of the previous work carried out by that firm. So then you need not again open up, you know, on a competitive bid process because you've already got uh, uh, preceding work done by the same firm. The second situation that GFR allows uh, you to uh, engage a consultant by nomination is that when there is an emergency. As an example, it says situations arising after natural disasters where Timely completion of the assignment is utmost important. The third scenario where the work that you want to get done requires the use of a proprietary technology or a technique which only one consultant has or, or any other uh, expertise that any one consultant has. Once again, need not go to the market and opening up a bid process. Nominate, uh, the consent consultant can be engaged through nomination. The fourth one, and possibly, like I mentioned earlier, the most broadly framed circumstance is where the, there are special circumstances where it becomes necessary to select a particular consultant with adequate justification for you know, such uh, nomination or single source selection in the overall interest of the ministry or department. But please remember, when trying to do this under this particular ground, it needs to be with the approval of the competent authority. It is as much stated in the GFR. The fifth and the last circumstance in which you possibly can go for nomination is where you're in a position to ensure fairness and equity, particularly where you can ensure that the prices that you're, the cost that you're getting from this particular consultant through nomination is reasonable and is consistent with market rates for tasks of similar nature. 
So this is where uh, the GFR uh, lays down in Rule Number 94 uh, the process for engaging a consultant through nomination. So I would request uh, you to go through the rule because I've only talked about it in a uh, excerpt manner. Of course, go through the entire rule and uh, you may then engage the consultant accordingly. Thank you so much, ma'am, for the detailed answer. So uh, next we have uh, uh, more of a comment and less of a question. So in fact, public procurement is a powerful public policy and sustainability tool. It is the essentiality of, er of error to propel the professionalization of public procurement in India in line with professionalism principle and the fundamental principle of public procurement envisaged in the GFR 2017. The capacity building of government officials shall be leveraged to postgraduate studies research level exclusively pertains to public procurement, like masters in public procurement management offered by ITC ILO. So this was a comment by Mr. Sujit. Next, we move on to a question from Madhusudan Hanumakam ji. So he says, I differ in the shortlisting of five agencies. So maybe Nidhi Nam can take this up. So he says, I differ in the shortlisting of five agencies on technical score. It should be top three only. So, uh, maybe one could do. Right. Uh, so, uh, Madhusudan ji, uh, absolutely, please feel free to disagree. Uh, the beauty of this entire stipulation is that uh, none of the documents, uh, like the uh, the stipulation, the model RFP that I was talking about, uh, it was not more than five. So, again, recommended in nature. So, the GFR under Rule 184 talks in terms of a minimum three, which I think is aligned with your thought structure. But there's no mandate as to the maximum. So minimum, you need to shortlist three. As far as maximum is concerned, the model RFP recommends five. The manual for procurement of consultancy and other services, as a matter of fact, recommends a um, maximum of eight. So uh, yes, I think you're on the right track here when you say that you want to take forward the top three, because that's the minimum mandate. Thank you, ma'am. So the last question for today is for Dr. Baswar Raju from uh, Mr. Naga Venkateshwar Rao. So uh, he wants to know what is the role of audit in m and &E and where it in, uh, where does audit intersect with the process of m and &E? so Dr. Baskar. Okay. If uh, my understanding is correct, it's a difference between auditing and uh, uh, M&E. Basically, uh, audit normally uh, you know, considered as, uh, you, know, you know, going for a fault finding, uh, uh, you know, mission is basically to go and understand where the mistakes and errors are conducted is mostly a financial uh, terminology uh, we borrow it from but in mnd especially when it comes to monitoring i would rather recognize monitoring as a supportive supervision because it provides a lot of scope for appreciating limitations of a program implementation normally monitoring is done while the program is implementing and evaluation is done after the program you know, completes its uh, you know probably the you know, lifetime uh, timeline so in monitoring and evaluation, we also appreciate uh, the positive things done, best practices, as well as uh, you know the limitations. What are the genuine reasons for you know the you know non-accomplishment of the program objectives? That's also the benefit of doubt is given to the implementer as well. But in monitoring in the auditing case, it's normally to understand that you know uh, the mistakes uh, made. That's my understanding. Thank you so much, sir. So uh, now we have a request from Mr. Parth Gautam uh, from the audience. He's an IRS officer. So uh, uh, he gave his hand. So could you please unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Yeah, am I audible, please? Yeah, yeah please, please go ahead. Uh, my question is either to Mr. Parezji or Nidhi Ma'am. Uh, I am deputy CEO of the Pradhan Mantri Jan Aushadi Pariyojana. So we do a lot of lab impanelment because we do a lot of volumes in terms of uh, uh, drugs is done by us. So all batches are tested at lab. So the process and methods you outlined are used. So our all impanelment is done on N1 basis and none of the time has QCB has been used till date. And one of the reasons uh, practically which uh, we face is that all the time we is one of the reasons why QCBS is not suggested is because there are certain times audit objections uh, which come. 
one time that why did you keep this criteria and sometimes even if no audit objections are coming then uh, sometimes you have complaints that these are restrictive measures so for example if i start a lab which is who glp certified i keep that and i ask 10 points for that now all other labs will reach uh, at the very top and say okay sir we are not being impaneled if we keep 10 points for that so one has to make a balance and it also leads to allegations sometimes of the that we are not really being fair to all the stakeholders and labs of india pharma labs are not being supported by us because at the end we are a commercial organization so having social objectives so how do you reconcile that and what would you suggest us to do so that'll be helpful maybe nidhi can answer so uh so one of the things that i would recommend in this case is that uh, when designing your conditions of eligibility uh you know particularly in terms of uh, uh, the financial capacity or for that matter uh, the eligible assignments etc while questions can be raised at any point in time but the proximity of the past experience to the future work so that needs to be ensured like in terms of whatever work that you want to get done the experience that you're seeking should be absolutely connected with it that's one way to justify it uh, i know it will not uh, stop the questions from being raised but perhaps it can be answered by saying that how what you're seeking is directly relevant for the future performance the other thing is also in terms of uh, let's say the the capacity of the uh, the capacity of the firms or the capacity of the applicants again uh, depending on the key person that you want to deploy want them to deploy etc uh, you can design the same and keep it directly relevant again to the outcome that you need so that should a question be raised your justification is backed by numbers like for example if the work needs to be delivered at a certain scale and it requires let's say five to six key personnel which only a firm of a certain financial strength can have so use that as a financial capacity mechanism and then perhaps to justify should a question be raised around why certain firms were included in the process and certain were excluded okay thank you ma'am so uh, with this i think uh, we are coming to close of the session but before we go for a short vote of thanks by my colleague uh, shailendra i just wanted to check if uh, uh, gulzar you have any final uh, comments um, looks like we have some technical issue but gulzar if you are able to hear um, do you have any final comments uh, sir can you hear me okay um uh, looks like uh, gulzar can you hear us yeah i can hear you uh, yes, nothing sir, it's been very useful uh, uh, though i would just uh, like to surface this point about making the specific case of procurement of technical consultancy services for mnd that is a distinct activity in and on itself which needs standard documents which are different from anything which is available there because like for example i mean you have an intervention in agriculture it's supposed to generate uh, some farm income increase or productivity increase is it really making in a, an impact what's the sort of and I, I, one would imagine there are four or five such categories of impact evaluations that we should be targeting at or we would that would form perhaps 85% of the universe of uh, uh, relevant impact evaluations relevant in the sense which are top of head for uh, systems or bureaucrats if we could sort of in some way identify those or categorize them and, and figure out some mod some guidance and uh, model documents for them that would be extremely useful for stakeholders from district collectors to heads of departments to state uh, secretariat uh, to sort of uh, uh, go ahead and initiate procurement that's one thing which uh, i would i mean and I, i'm i'm narrowing it down considerably down to one specific area of mnd uh, technical consulting service provi providers thank you thanks it's been very useful thank you very much thanks gulzar i think you raised a very very important point uh we are here uh, of course uh, largely 
uh, focused on strengthening monitoring and evaluation ecosystem. So we are trying to build a web-based uh, capabilities, you know, uh, so that uh, we address some of the requirements of our uh, colleagues in ministries and departments as well as states. So uh, uh, over a period of time, I think we will be uploading all the terms of references that we have developed for various studies. We will be uploading all the uh, RFPs. In fact, they are there, but we'll put them in a consolidated manner, maybe by individual sector. And uh, we are also going to launch uh, extensive uh, large scale surveys across the country for food uh, subsidies, fuel subsidy and so forth. So we will also be uploading all those instruments and, uh, uh, and also the survey methods and uh, so forth. So thank you for your uh, um, suggestion. Uh, we will seriously take up that work. With this, uh, now I request my colleague, uh, Deputy DG, Shailandaji to uh, give us a word of thanks. Surely, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is actually my privilege to uh, now formally thank all the participants, speakers, uh, the panelists uh, for the day, uh, for today's webinar. And uh, we really hope that uh, the webinar on procurement of technical consultancy provided key insights uh, to everyone uh, uh, based on the presentations, discussions, and some ideas for the future that were uh, shared by uh, the panelists today. Uh, we have all agreed during the session that uh, the procurement of technical services and with a particular focus on monitoring and evaluation uh, can go a long way in strengthening the monitoring and evaluation uh, ecosystem. And uh, we will together continue to work in that direction. I wish to extend my gratitude to the speakers, uh, uh, Shri Guljar Natarajan, uh, Dr. Baswaraju Shrestha, uh, Ms. Nidhi Arora, and uh, uh, Paresh Dokar for uh, their valuable uh, contributions to today's discussion. Uh, a special thanks to Dr. Shekhar Bonu, uh, DG DMEO, for providing overall guidance and leadership to undertake these activities under uh, DMEO uh, to strengthen the ecosystem, our webinars, uh, uh, for the states, uh, as uh, Mr. Guljar mentioned at the beginning, are uh, being received well, and we will continue to make efforts to uh, make uh, useful uh, interactions with the state going forward as well. Thank you, everyone, and I really thank everyone here at DMEO who has made this event possible. Uh, thank you, Rohani, especially for all your hard work and putting all those very interesting questions uh, together and, and thank you once again to the panels for uh, all the answers that we could provide today. So let's keep this discussion going. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thanks, Deepak uh, Kapil, also for all the hard work and thanks uh, to our NIC colleagues also for making this event. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. Thank, thank you. you so much. I think it closes uh, everyone. Uh, webinar. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for. <laughs>